today. Um, so again, I'm Shelby Eigenbrode. Uh, I'm actually based in Denver, so it's kind of cool to see all the different, um, everyone's from around the world in this session. So thanks for everyone that posted that. Um, so again, AWS uh, AIML Specialist Solutions Architect. So for this session, what we were gonna do is focus on building machine learning pipelines with Amazon SageMaker. So for those that are unfamiliar, Amazon SageMaker is our ML service, right? That sits kind of in the middle tier of our stack. If you've seen kind of this AIML AWS stack, we have Amazon SageMaker, which is essentially an AWS service that has a bunch of services within it and features and capabilities to really kind of cover the end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle, um, specifically for you know building out custom models, um, that sort of thing. So it covers everything from like data preparation to building and training your models, to deploying your models, and then kind of the ongoing operational and management of those models. But specifically inside this session, what we're going to do is we're going to cover. First, we're going to talk about some of the key technology agnostic. Um, implications or considerations when building out automated machine learning workflows or machine learning pipelines, as well as incorporating um, CI/CD practices within those machine learning pipelines. And then we'll cover a specific implementation of how to build out ML pipelines, how to build out CI/CD pipelines for machine learning by looking further into a service called Amazon SageMaker Pipelines. So we'll cover a specific technology implementation after we talk about some of the technology agnostic considerations. So here's kind of the agenda for today. So again, we're gonna cover you know, technology agnostic considerations, and then we'll dive into, um, we'll talk quickly about you know, kind of this, the, the array of tools and technology that are available for kind of implementing ML ops practices and machine learning pipelines and CICD pipelines. But we will dive deeper into um, specifically SageMaker pipelines and projects when we talk about a core implementation. So first, let's talk about some of the challenges. And I imagine a lot of you are, are very familiar with these as you're here. Um, but in terms of creating and managing machine learning workflows, um, we run into a lot of different challenges. So some of those challenges are machine learning comprises multiple steps. And you know, from data preparation, model training, to model deployment. And not only do they have these steps, uh, some of these take place in sequence, some take it place parallel, and there's really a lot that goes into stitching these different workflows together. So it's not necessarily a single workflow. So as an example, your data preparation step may contain, you know, one to many tasks under that that ultimately go into taking a raw data set and eventually transforming it into a training data set. Uh, same with the model training steps, right? You may, ha may have some additional steps inside your model training, whether you're doing things like, you know, single model training, or maybe you're running multiple different experiments using like hyperparameter optimization. Uh, same with model deployment, right? Inside model deployment, even though it's kind of one step in the workflow, it could have many tasks underneath it. So you could be deploying to a staging environment, a production environment. You could also be injecting different like controls inside there, right, where there's a manual approval for the model deployment. So there's a lot of different steps, a lot of different dependencies, kind of disparate pipelines and workflows that kind of have to work together to ultimately build this and, and build out something that provides iteration, right, ability to iterate across the life cycle, but also that end-to-end -end traceability in terms of how do you track, you know, models that were trained in a model development environment, where they're deployed into a production environment, how they're deployed, what versions deployed. And a lot of this, you know, in and of itself is can be complicated and challenging. But then when you start to incorporate CI CD practices on top of all of this, if you look at each of those steps, if we look at CI CD practices like source and version control, you can see each of these steps has code that goes along with it too, right? So when we incorporate those practices, we want to start to capture code that goes into each of these steps and the tasks within each of these steps. And to do this, you know, you have to package your code recipes. Um, you have to define what order they need to execute in, keep track of all that code. Then you have ML specific considerations like data, right? So versioning of source code isn't necessarily new. Um, if you're familiar with DevOps practices in general or software development, you know, there's nothing typically new there. It's just there's a lot more pieces to stitch together. But what's new is we also have things like data, right? So we have to track and version our data, which becomes an input into different steps in our overall machine learning workflow. 
we also have some new artifacts right inside this workflow that we need to consider. So not only do we have our package code, uh, but we also have things like our model artifact. So our deployable model artifact, that's a result of that model training step that needs to be tracked. So all of this just means there's a lot to stitch together, right? To be able to create these CI CD pipelines. And you know, a lot of times the CI CD tools aren't necessarily built for machine learning separately. So what happens in reality is there's often a lot of combinations between different tools and integrations. So you may use something that's purpose built for ML for your data preparation, your model training. And you know, overall have a CI CD orchestration layer to actually implement those CI CD practices on top of the really ML specific tasks inside your pipeline. So all of this, you know, can be complicated and challenging to kind of stitch together. And one of the things that makes it, I guess, even more complicated is that there really isn't a single golden pipeline to go to. So just like there's not a golden pipeline for DevOps there really isn't a single golden pipeline for machine learning. And the reason is because like the technical implementation, the organizational structure, um, tools you need to integrate with may vary. However, what we can do and what we can standardize on pretty well is that the steps and the core components that we recommend remain the same across the machine learning workflow. And then it just comes down to, you know, a specific implementation for a customer, maybe because they have additional corporate or regulatory requirements, additional tools that need to be integrated with. So, and even when you look at SageMaker in particular, depending on how you use SageMaker, the steps that we saw in that previous picture can vary once you start to get into the tasks within those steps. So as an example with SageMaker, if you're using one of the built-in containers for training, that step or that workflow looks a little bit different than if you bring your own container for training. Because if you bring your own, you may have one additional step to build that container image. So it can vary a little bit depending on you know, the tools you need to integrate with as well as how you're using SageMaker. So that being said, just kind of covering the high level challenges. If we, and that's challenges not only with creating kind of automated workflows, but also with incorporating CI CD practices. I wanted to take a little bit of a step back and just kind of explain, you know, when we talk about automated workflows, versus machine learning pipelines that incorporate CI CD, what are some of the, the kind of key differences there that we see? And really this view here, and this is a super high level view, right? It, it doesn't have nearly the amount of tasks within each of these steps that typically happen in a workflow. And it also doesn't necessarily accommodate the handoffs that can happen as well. But it shows a really high level machine learning workflow where you know, a lot of customers will start with first automating the tasks within the workflow applying a level of orchestration to determine, you know, what step should execute when, so that all of the steps can be orchestrated together in, in a pipeline, essentially. And then, or in parallel, which we're seeing a lot more often now, is in parallel incorporating a lot more of those MLOps practices like CICD, where we also see like the source and version control that we talked about before, not only for code, but for data, as well as model artifacts. Um, you know, establishing things like a feature store so that you can basically share, curate, um, or share and discover curated features uh, for model building, as well as, you know, using those features for model hosting as well. And you see in this picture something called a model registry. So uh, almost always when I start to talk with customers or organizations, I make sure that they have a model registry in place. And we'll kind of talk about the importance of a model registry later. But basically for managing model versions at scale and establishing that traceability. And also for, you can see in this workflow here, there's kind of two distinct phases, if you will. There's model building activities and there's model deployment activities. And often it's tough to bridge those because you have different personas, different tasks that are handling these end-to-end -end, um, capabilities. So the idea here is to establish as much automation in between the steps orchestrate the automation between those, but also have automated quality gates as well. So when we talk about CI CD practices, it's not only like source version control, um, you know, automated builds or automated training, but also those automated quality gates, which are definitely probably the toughest thing to inject inside there. Um, but essentially establishing uh, quality gates for those handoffs, right? So understanding what are the checkpoints that need to happen, automating as much as that can between the personas. Um, 
And if you don't see, and you don't see specific technologies listed here, and, and that's quite on purpose in this particular stage, mainly to just show that the workflow doesn't change, the core components that we recommend really don't change, but the technical implementation of those may change a little bit depending on the services or the tools that you, you choose to use and the ones that meet your use case the best. So let's cover a few key architectural considerations. So if we look back at that CICD pipeline um, that we saw on the previous slide, if we think about how do we want to build out our own pipelines or what are some of the key considerations we need to think of when we're actually designing a CICD pipeline for our machine learning workloads. So we'll cover a few of those here. So the first thing is identify your source code. So when you look at your pipeline, what it takes to basically take a model um, or build, develop, build a model, ultimately deploy that, uh, whether that's, you know, to a real-time use case, whatever the case is, but to take that end-to-end -end machine learning workflow, you first want to identify all of your source code, right? So if we look at the inputs that are required for SageMaker, they're, they're pretty much, you know, things like uh, training code, uh, it could be just configuration, it could just be hyperparameters if you're using a built-in algorithm. So you want to look at all the code, and that code includes uh, not only the training code, the inference code, but also the infrastructure as code, the configuration as code, the pipeline as code. So examples here would be like if you are to deploy a SageMaker endpoint, for example, you're probably going to have some infrastructure and configuration code to go along with that as well for the deployment of that endpoint. Um, so you want to treat that as code and accordingly store it in a source code repository under version control, like you would any other kind of application feature function code. Next, you want to identify all of your versioned input. So if we look at that workflow, each of those high level steps inside that workflow have a specific input. So you want to make sure that you're looking at all of your versioned inputs, such as common data science libraries and packages. Um, this would be in the example if you're bringing your own code or bringing your own um, container to SageMaker. You want to make sure that you are capturing, you know, what are the levels of the different libraries and packages that you're bringing in. You also want to capture the container images themselves as versioned inputs. And again, this can change, right, in terms of how you use SageMaker. If you're using one of the pre-built container images, you're not necessarily building that container image, you're just using a particular version of that container image. Whereas if you are doing bring your own container, um, in that case, you not only have your Docker code that was used to build that container image, but the container image version itself as an input. And then finally, with machine learning, we already talked about this, but you have that new versioned input to consider, which is data. So your training data becomes a versioned input that you need to consider in terms of being able to establish that end-to-end -end traceability that we see with CI/CD pipelines. Next, we need to identify all the versioned artifacts. So if you look at that machine learning workflow um, for the steps that have versioned artifacts that come out that are consumable by a next step, you need to identify all those versioned artifacts and how you're going to keep track of all those versioned artifacts as well. So this it can include things like container images, right? Like I mentioned, if you're doing bring your own container and you're building a container image as part of your pipeline, you'll have a versioned artifact that's a container image that may be used into your next step, which is training or deployment, depending on what that container image is for. Um, you'll also have data. And the reason here that you see data as a version input, as well as an artifact that we just talked about, is that our pipelines are typically going to include a data processing step. Um, and you probably saw that on the previous slide. And that data processing step is typically going to take raw data, process it into the formats it's expected for training. And that step may have multiple tasks within it, you know, for um, data transformations, cleansing, all that kind of stuff. Um, but essentially the reason data becomes a version artifact is as well as an input is while that particular data set may be input into your data processing task, it also is an artifact that's used by your training step, right? It's a dependency inside your training step to have that process data. Next, you wanna identify all the quality gates. And this one is, is by far the hardest, right? In terms of implementing the quality gates and establishing what those quality gates should be. Um, so some, this is just an example of some of the quality gates that you would want to implement, things like model evaluation. So 
how did your model perform? You know, looking at things like objective metrics that you're trying to optimize for, whether that's accuracy, whether it's F1 score, um, having those quality gates inside your pipeline. And we'll get to see an example of that within SageMaker um, pipelines and projects later. But model evaluation is a common one. Data validation would be uh, another potential quality gate that you would inject just to make sure that um, you know, data is in the format you expect it to be. Um, it's the distribution is what you expect, all those different kinds of things for data validation. Container image scans is another common one, because like we mentioned, in the case of you know, bring your own container, a lot of companies, especially larger corporations, have established processes, established tools to perform container image scans to make sure you're not bringing in any um, vulnerable packages. So that might be another one. Any required reporting, so things like explainability reports that maybe need to be generated before a model can deploy to production. And then manual gates here as well, right? So there's continuous delivery and then there's continuous deployment. And a lot of times we'll have those um, manual gates for continuous delivery where you want to have a checkpoint before something ultimately gets deployed to staging or it gets deployed to production because it requires, you know, either some type of manual approval, validation, peer review, or it could be, you know, it's tied to some type of marketing release or um, a branding type of a, a gate. Next. Oh. <laughs> and then we also want to identify the deployment strategy, right? So you first want to identify how that model is going to be consumed. And the reason that matters is because how that model is going to be consumed depends on how you're going to kind of set up your workflow, right, or your pipeline. Um, so in this case, since we're talking in terms of SageMaker, you want to understand, are you going to deploy it using SageMaker Batch Transform, um, async inference, which isn't listed here, it's a newer capability, but async inference, or is it going to be deployed to a persistent endpoint? So you want to understand, like, how is it actually going to be consumed? And then you also want to understand what are the particular SageMaker deployment features that you may want to take advantage of to ensure that they're in scope of the pipe, pipeline as well. So as an example, multi-model endpoint, inference pipeline, A-B testing, um, model monitor, those can impact the way that your steps are performed in the pipeline. So understanding how your model needs to be deployed, how it's going to be consumed. Um, and then also you want to look at making sure that you're still doing the what train once deploy many strategy. So similar to DevOps practices where you do build once deploy many, you wanna do the same for your machine learning workloads where you are training it once, taking that model artifact, ultimately deploying it to one or more target environments. You don't wanna retrain across target environments, not only for um, you know, cost reasons, it can be very expensive, models can train for hours, days, uh, but also for you know, ensuring consistency, reliability, you're not bringing in anything inadvertently across your environments. Um, nope. My clicker is not working as well. And then finally, identifying all your operational needs up front. And, and this is where, you know, we talked about it in the previous session and just in MLOps in general, we talk a lot about establishing cross-functional teams because there are so many personas that span a machine learning pipeline and workflow. Um, it's really important to think about all these things up front, to be able to understand how you would build out a pipeline, how you build out that workflow, how you automate all those handoffs. So this is where those cross-functional teams are, are really important to be able to understand the logs and metrics like a data scientist may need to have access to in their environment for you know, model evaluation. So ensuring that as your model moves across environments, you know, it's typical that a data scientist may not have access to the production environment that a model's deployed to, but they still may need logs and metrics from that to be able to evaluate model performance over time and have visibility into that. So we just kind of covered all of the architectural considerations to think about when you're building your own CI CD pipeline for models. One other thing to kind of talk about here is if we look at just a conceptual view, because we talked about the pipeline and how there's there's two phases, right? You kind of have your model building and you have your model deployment. And the fact that uh, it's very often the case where, you know, it's not just one person or one persona that's handling this end to end. So when we think about some of the architectural considerations and one of the things I brought up where I always encourage uh, teams to have a model registry in place. And the reason for that is not only because it helps you manage versions of models at scale, because it contains 
it's a central store essentially for model metadata, right? So containing everything about how that model was built in the model build environment, as well as you know how it performed. So how it was built, what training image was used, what training data was used, what how it performed. So how did that model perform according to that objective metric that you're trying to optimize for? But also for that specific version of a model, like where is it deployed? How is it deployed? As well as, you know, how is it performing over time? So all of those things are really important to be able to scale and manage models, especially multiple versions of models. So you can see inside here, this is just a high level conceptual view in terms of bridging that gap from model build to model deploy activities. Because a lot of times in the model building or model kind of development stage, you have a data scientist or running through a ton of different experiments to find that optimal candidate model that will eventually get registered into a model registry and um, be a candidate for deployment to one or more target environments. So that model registry almost becomes a handoff point or like a contract between those two phases in um, the machine learning life cycle. And it also helps scale in terms of the management of all these different model versions. And then you can kind of see in terms of the model retraining workflows, you know, if you're retraining your model based on metrics, so like data drift, or you're retraining based on a schedule or based on an event like new data coming in, um, essentially the idea is those same code that you use in your model and building environment. So that model building pipeline or that model building workflow code that you've built out, you should be able to use that same code inside your model retraining pipelines as well. Um, so the key is there, you know, you do have to write some decoupled code, code that can be automated inside of a pipeline really easily. So that being said, that was some of like this high level considerations, a conceptual view of kind of bridging the gap between um, the model build and model deploy activities as we look at that entire end to end workflow. But now we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about tech, some tech in particular. So. First, we'll talk about SageMaker, right? Uh, I'm sure everyone um, has heard of SageMaker, and I kind of brought up an intro of what SageMaker is to, um, at the beginning. But we'll just kind of see as an overview where it's at in our A, uh, AWS AIML stack. And then we'll talk about some of the tools and technology that we see in the area where we have native integrations. But then we'll dive more into SageMaker's native solution, which is projects and pipelines. So many of you have probably seen this. It's kind of the AWS ML stack. This just shows, you know, we have our ML services, which are higher level services that are either pre-trained models that you access via API or they're models that are built using more auto ML capabilities. Then we have Amazon SageMaker, that middle tier, which is um, basically our ML services tier. And within that, we have basically a set of features capabilities for end-to-end -end building of machine learning models. And there is still, you know, autopilot for some of those auto ML capabilities as well. But the idea at this level is to allow data scientists, machine learning developers to build custom models using a set of features and capabilities that span the end-to-end -end life cycle. And then at the bottom tier, we have our ML frameworks and infrastructure. Um, and just to kind of level set, you know, the, the tier that we've been talking about largely today is SageMaker and the one that we'll talk about in terms of technology. But a lot of those, you know, CICD practices that we talked about before, the considerations for, for building out machine learning pipelines, they really apply, you know, kind of across that stack. Um, some of the things may change depending on what level of the stack you're using. So as an example, if you're using an AI service where you're accessing a pre-trained model through an API, in that case, your ML ops story becomes more of kind of that data pipeline, you know, that you're pre-processing data before hitting that API um, and then post-processing data. So you're not necessarily managing versions of models in that case. So that being said, we're focusing primarily on SageMaker for this session. And if we just look really high level at, you know, this is just, you know, some of the tools and technology that's available for building out machine learning pipelines and incorporating CICD practices within those pipelines. So you can see kind of in the center section here, uh, oop, I'll use a pointer. Um, those are SageMaker native services, right? So we have SageMaker pipelines, which is purpose-built for SageMaker. Um, we have AWS step functions, which is another um, tool for automated workflows. Again, you don't have to manage the underlying compute, same with pipelines. And then we have Amazon managed workflows for Apache Airflow. So 
really, you know, targeted at some of those model building automated workflows. But in addition to that, we do have third party integrations and examples as well. So we have um, SageMaker components, if you're unfamiliar with those, but that's for integration with Kubeflow. Um, we have Apache Airflow where we contribute operators to Apache Airflow as well, as well as a gamut of others that just aren't included on here, right? Everything in SageMaker is API based. So you can essentially integrate it with anything that you can integrate, you know, an API or a CLI with. Um, and then on the bottom tier is kind of the CI CD tooling that you see kind of stacked on top of a lot of that automated tooling or the automated workflow tooling. So here you have projects and we'll talk about the difference between projects and pipelines. Uh, the developer developer tools on AWS. So there's like code commit, code pipeline, code build, Amazon ECR, which is Elastic Container Registry, which is essentially the you know store for those container images to allow you to version those images. Also, also it's what is accepted as input into SageMaker training, processing, and um, hosting steps as well. But then you see over here, third-party integrations and examples, right? There's customers that use GitHub, Bitbucket, Jenkins, Artifactory. So we try not to focus as intently on the tool set initially, but more on what is an organization trying to achieve? What are the existing tool sets they may have to integrate with? And then how do we incorporate that into an overall CI CD pipeline? So that being said, <clears throat> we are going to focus a little bit on the technology deep dive side on SageMaker projects and pipelines, because it is the um, recommended approach, right? If you're building out pipelines for SageMaker, the recommended approach is to use SageMaker projects and pipelines to do that. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for that as well. But the reason we include this on here is we realize that there's, you know, there's definitely reasons for utilizing other services or tools. There, you may have existing skill sets, you may have a ton of assets already built up in that particular tool set where, you know, we may have a hybrid or approach to that. So that being said, let's dive into SageMaker projects and pipelines. So I'm going to talk super briefly about the capabilities high level. <clears throat> and this is basically just kind of an overview of pipelines. And pipelines really is a, it's kind of an umbrella set of features. And we'll talk about what those core components are within it. But the goal behind them is we heard from customers that, you know, that building these workflows out is hard, like stitching together all these services, all these integrations that need to be set up underneath, you know, things like setting up the right um, IAM or identity access management roles and privileges to be able to connect all these steps together, setting up the integrations between services, whether it's AWS native or even using third parties. It's just hard, right? <laughs> so SageMaker Pipelines was created to take some of that heavy lift off of data scientists, machine learning engineers, so that we could be offer it as a service to essentially allow data scientists, engineers to build out these machine learning workflows easily. So not only the model build workflows, but also the automated deployment pipelines as well to ultimately be able to deploy models, version models, um, track models. So you can see in the way that we did it, we have an SDK, right? So like with anything, there's gonna be an SDK with it that allows you to build out model training or model building workflows. We also have um, a model registry that's contained within it. And we'll talk about that component. But like I mentioned, a model registry is really important for being able to track all of the metadata about a particular model version, as well as you know, how it performed and where it's deployed at any given time. And then uh, fully managed ML ops with built-in support for CI CD. And we'll talk about how that comes together. So not only can you automate your workflows, but you can also incorporate those CI CD practices that we talked about with source and version control, um, as well as you know automated triggers, that sort of thing, without having to kind of go in and manu manually set that up. And then end-to-end -end lineage tracking for governance and audits. And, the, audits. and this is um, really important, right? Especially for large enterprises, large companies, large organizations, when you're managing a ton of models at scale or you have corporate or regulatory requirements, being able to have that end-to-end -end traceability is key, not only for that governance and audit, but also for reliability, right? So someone accidentally deletes an endpoint. Um, can you recover from that? And you should be able to do that if you have the CICD kind of controlled pipelines in place. So this one is just showing um, with pipelines, we're going to do the demo and the demo will be done in SageMaker Studio. If you're unfamiliar with SageMaker Studio, 
Studio is essentially an integrated workbench for using SageMaker features and capabilities kind of across the board. Um, keep in mind that most of these features and capabilities are they're accessible through API as well or CLI. But in terms of like the visualization and the integrated experience, um, a lot of those are contained within SageMaker Studio. So we'll do the demo out of Studio today. And then SageMaker feature integration. So another one of the you know, features or functionality for pipelines is like I meant it or mentioned it's purpose built for SageMaker. So as a result, like you would probably expect, it does have all of the integrations, you know, in place with a lot of those key SageMaker features you would expect. So integration with training, processing, all of the, the essentially the services or features that you would need to use inside your tasks in your workflow to be able to build out those particular steps. So that being said, Pipelines really has three components to it. So we'll go through each of these three components and then I'll do kind of a quick demo so you can see how it all fits together because a demo sometimes pulls it all together a little bit better. Um, but the first component is Pipelines. So a little bit confusing, but we do have a component called Pipelines within SageMaker Pipelines. And what Pipelines is really focused on is building out automated workflows specifically for model building activities. So things like data preparation, uh, model training, model evaluation, all of those things that happen kind of in the model build or model development stage. So automating all of those workflows. Um, and the key within pipelines is, you know, as you would expect, there are native support for steps like SageMaker training, SageMaker processing for your data pre-processing, but there's also workflow steps as well. So allowing you to add things in like conditional logic, like you see here. So not only do you train the model, you can add in a conditional step for you know, is the model accuracy above a certain threshold? If yes, register the model for a candidate for production. If no, you know, let's continue to iterate on that. There's also some steps, additional steps that are supported for pipeline. So like the ability to set up a step that executes a Lambda function. So if you have a function that needs to be executed, maybe it's a custom quality gate, that sort of thing, you can set up a Lambda step as well inside here. You, there's callback steps as well. So you're not necessarily limited to SageMaker native steps inside pipelines, because with a callback step, you can integrate with other, integrate with tasks that are gonna run on other AWS services or even other third-party um, applications as well. The other thing inside pipelines to keep in mind is pipelines do support caching, step caching. And the reason this is kind of cool is because with step caching, what you can essentially do is cache the results of the previous step um, so that it doesn't have to execute again. So an example here might be, so you have your data preparation step, you have your model training step. Let's say you execute your pipeline and you realize in the model training step, you wanna tweak a couple of the hyperparameters. In that case, you don't necessarily want to rerun that data preparation step again. So with step caching, you can basically pick that step back up where it changed and re-execute using the output from the previous step again without re-executing it. So that's good not only for like saving time, right? Because you don't want to spend another couple hours on data prep if your job's taking a couple hours to run, but also cost, right? You don't necessarily want to rerun the exact same data step just to run through a pipeline. Um, there's also, um, built-in support for experiment tracking here too. So each pipeline execution is going to automatically log with SageMaker experiments, which is another feature inside SageMaker for experiment tracking. So capturing, you know, all the metadata about, you know, how was that model training job run um, for just basically efficient uh, training or experiment tracking. And this is a simple pipeline, right? But you can certainly build out more complex pipelines with conditional criteria, different evaluation steps as well. But this kind of brings us to our next component, you know, so once let's say you register a model, which this is showing model registry, right? So the second component is really model registry. And what that does is allow you to track that model lineage that we talked about. So not only how is that model built, how did it perform, where is it deployed to, um, and one you can, unique aspect of SageMaker's implementation of model registry is it does have a built-in approval workflow too, to allow you to either approve or reject a model for downstream deployment. Um, and this is used really in conjunction with the third component, that automated workflow capability, which is called projects. And SageMaker projects is really what ties all of this together, as well as incorporating CI/CD practices on top of that. So. <clears throat> 
projects really includes pre-configured MLOps project templates that are pre-configured and they allow you to automatically create and configure your machine learning pipelines that also incorporates practices like source and version control without having to go in and separately set up the integration to your source code repository or automatic or go in and set up event triggers to trigger those, you know, pipelines based on like new code committing or that sort of thing. So projects uses pre-configured templates to automatically set all that up for you and stitch together all of those pieces of the pipeline that we kind of talked about before that incorporate not only, you know, the automation, but also the CICD practices that really enable that end-to-end -end traceability. So basically it just means you don't have to manually go in and set up all those integration points. So that being said, we'll cover a couple items before we run into the demo. Um, you can use projects for end-to-end -end pipelines, but you can optionally use those different components we talked about individually as well. Um, so you can use pipelines or model registry without projects if you wanted to meet the needs of your use case. So it kind of depends on your use case. And then this one is the extensibility. And we'll talk about this when I go into the demo where you can take advantage of built-in MLOps project templates, or you can create your own custom MLOps project templates to standardize and create repeatability in how your machine learning pipelines are developed. So that being said, I said a lot, but I wanna get into a demo here. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. All right. Um, so within this screen here, you can see I'm in the AWS console under SageMaker and specifically under SageMaker Studio, which is that integrated workbench. And you can see if you want to use SageMaker projects, um, essentially what you do is you enable projects at the domain level inside your account. So for each studio domain, you need to essentially enable, this is a toggle if it's not already enabled. So you just need to make sure that is enabled. And what that actually ends up doing is pulling in a set of pre-configured templates that we'll look at in a second that are project templates um, and allows you access to those inside the studio console. So if we go into studio, so we're in studio itself here, you'll see we have projects, we have pipelines. Like I said, you can use pipelines without projects, um, but we're gonna focus primarily on using projects inside this demo. So you can see I have one pre-baked in here just because it takes some time to build that out and stitch all this stuff together. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you how you create a project and then we'll look at what it actually is doing behind the scenes. So to create a project, you just hit create project. And then here you see the built-in templates that we kind of talked about. So there are a set of built-in templates here. And these are templates that are created, owned, and managed by the um, SageMaker service team. And they're pre-configured and you can see they all serve different purposes. Some are for end-to-end, -end, so model, build, train, deploy. Um, some are just for like model deployment. So say you want to standardize on SageMaker for deployment, you could use simply the model deployment pattern and which includes a model registry and automated deployment pipelines and source code for deployment specifically, or you can use it end to end. Um, there also is support, you can see inside here, there's support for using third-party Git repositories. So we have customers that use, you know, GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, Bitbucket, and they want to take advantage of their own um, source code repositories. So we do have templates for those as well. We also have a template for Jenkins, right? So in addition to using your own custom source version control, uh, maybe you're already using something like Jenkins for your CI CD orchestration. So you can do that as well. The other thing inside there is you can build organizational templates. So you can definitely customize your own templates. You can use the existing ones. They're fully, there's nothing secret about these. The code is all out there. Um, you can use these existing ones, create your own organization templates that maybe implement some additional practices that are really key to you and your team. And they just become available basically through this um, interface, right? Where they could basically be provisioned over and over again. So that being said, I'm just gonna kind of pick one of these just to kind of show you how it gets um, done, created. But you basically select your project template, in this case, it's kind of a simple project template. So the build, train, deploy using code pipeline, all the code suite under the covers. Put in a name. This one is only asking for really one thing and description optionally on parameter. With custom projects, you can ask for multiple things. So you could ask for, you know, like BBC, that kind of stuff as well. So I'm just gonna hit create project here. 
And this takes a few minutes because under the covers, it's doing a lot because it's basically pre-configuring your model build environment with seed code that it'll put in place, um, as well as the model deploy environment. So the you know code pipeline, it's going to set up code pipeline on each side. It's going to set up your source code repositories. It's going to seed it with code. Um, it'll automatically set up and configure, you know, model registry, all those pieces together, because I did the full build, build train deploy pipeline. But while that's being created, we'll look at one that's kind of pre-baked over here. So you see inside here, essentially what happens after that project gets created, usually, you know, three to five minutes-ish. Um, basically, you have this set of um, components, right, inside there. So we have our code repositories. For build, train, deploy, it's automatically going to set up two different um, repositories. They'll have a build, which has all of your build code, so like data pre-processing code, training code, all of those things that are essentially part of that left-hand side of the picture to actually ultimately build and train a model. And then you'll have your deployment code, which is essentially all of the things to, to like configure an endpoint, so cloud formation templates to provision a SageMaker endpoint. And you can see inside Studio, you can clone this repo. So you essentially, when you clone this repo, you clone it to your local Studio environment. So you can work on the code directly inside Studio, you know, do your commits um, directly inside Studio. And then pipeline. So like I mentioned, it does do some seed code automatically. So the seed code will actually get put inside here to generate a pipeline. The pipeline itself is essentially just code. It's all codified pipeline. So if we take a look at one of these examples, this is again just the seed code. You can see where we're doing these basic steps like data pre-processing, we're training, um, we're evaluating the model, then we're doing a conditional step inside there is the MSE above a certain threshold, and then we register that model. So this is all targeted on the model building activities. And if we were go or to go and look at the code itself, you can see it's all just basically a codified pipeline. So all of the code that is used to build out this pipeline that we see here is right here. So it's all pipeline as code. And that being said, so once that pipeline executes, I have a few pre-baked here as well, but model groups is really where that model registry comes in. So you can see here, there's a model group, which is essentially you know, a specific machine learning use case tied to this project. And if I go in here, there's multiple versions of this specific model because we run through that pipeline a few times. And you can see right now, you know, we have model version one in the prod environment. We have model version two in staging. But now we have this third new version um, that's kind of waiting and pending approval. So what you can do inside SageMaker model registry in conjunction with SageMaker projects is basically, you know, take a look at that model version. Uh, you know, you can look at the metrics, like let's see how it performed. And then, you know, if those metrics are above a threshold, you, you can do automated deployment. But in this case, we have more of continuous delivery in place. You can modify that. But in this case, you know, let's say that does meet our minimum criteria to deploy to a target environment. You just update the status, you know, have someone approve it. Once you set this approval, like you've approved it for deployment to the other target environments, what happens because you use projects is that behind the scenes set up an automated model deployment pipeline for you and those automatic triggers are in place. So the automatic trigger, once a model is approved in the model registry is then gonna trigger your model deployment pipeline to ultimately deploy your endpoint to first a staging environment and then a production environment. So all of this kind of gets pre-configured through the use of projects. Like I said, you could use pipelines by itself, um, but projects is what really kind of ties everything together and also incorporates those CI CD practices. So if we were to go kind of look at code pipeline here, you'll see we have a model build pipeline that contains all the model build steps and actually runs SageMaker pipeline pipeline code that you saw there. Um, and why that's important is, you know, at a, for a retraining pipeline, you're gonna to need to execute those same set of steps over and over again, right? And you don't necessarily want a data scientist in there having to kind of, you know, ah, now it's time to retrain again. Um, so it also automatically sets up that model build pipeline as well. And then you have your model deploy pipeline. Again, this is automatically set up through projects and you can see it sets up a standard set of steps. Again, you can customize these with custom projects um, as well, but you can see here, we're basically taking code from code commit in this case, because we chose the, template that uses code commit under the under the scene or behind the scenes. 
Uh, then we go into build deployment. Basically, it's just taking the code from that code repository, building out the CloudFormation template that's ultimately going to be used to deploy it to a staging environment. And you can see inside here the way that we deploy is through infrastructure configuration as code as well, right? Because it's essentially using CloudFormation. Um, none of that is abstracted. You have complete visibility into that. So you can see it's using CloudFormation um, code build to essentially deploy it. And then there's a, you know, a manual approval step inside here. These can be customized kind of depending on your use case and what your needs are. Um, and I did want to show you real quick, when we went through those projects, you saw that there's built in and then there's custom. Um, if you're wondering where those are at or what do those templates look like, if you go into AWS Service Catalog, you can see those templates. If you go under portfolios in the administration view, if you go to imported, these are all the built in templates. So if you click on this, you'll see all of the built in templates that are available inside the studio console. And this usually becomes more of a, you know, admin type role, a service catalog admin, cloud platform admin type role, who ends up ultimately, you know, making these different templates available to data scientists. Data scientists are the consumers of the templates. They typically aren't the ones that are necessarily creating all of these templates. They're the ones consuming them most often. Um, so these built-in templates, you know, these are automatically available for consumption. But one of the things I wanted to show you is, one of the things I always recommend is, I never start from scratch typically when I'm creating a custom template because you can see inside here all the different versions of the templates are listed and you can pull the code from here directly, right? So you just pull the code from here. You can use this to create your own custom templates where you may inject different steps or just have different processes in place that you want to customize a little bit more. So that being said, we went through a ton. Um, one thing I didn't see is if I had it, I couldn't see the chat at the same time. So let me try to go through and see if I missed any questions. There is a step-by-step -step guide. Um, let me go to the end here. I have some resources. This is kind of this and this. I don't, I don't mind sharing this in PDF form. There's a bunch of resources at the end of these slides um, that I definitely recommend checking out that go into it in more detail. Also, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn um, as well. I'm happy to kind of provide some more resources as well there. Uh, I think some of them is asking for the slides. Uh... Is uh, are you able to share the slides with you know? I think the slides have all of those resources. Yeah, I can do. Um, I'll share the slide in PDF form if that works for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And just looking at some of the yeah, and Python is the only language today supported for defining um, pipeline steps. Uh, just quick reminder, everyone, if you have questions, uh, feel free to post in the chat. Uh, we are going through the Q and A right now. Uh, again, if you uh, prefer to speak, ask questions, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand. Um, let's see, versioning of code for each step. There is definitely versioning. So we break out the code in in pipe our projects by default. We break out the code into model build and model deploy code. Um, for a couple of reasons, mainly because there could be different personas and typically the iteration cycles are different, right? The life cycles or the actual um, life cycle of that code is a little bit different between them. Um, so we do have the code broken out separately. It could be broken out further, but we break it out into model build and model deploy code. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the difference between automation and CICD. So automation is used, right? To apply CICD practices. But just straight automation is, you know, I can easily just automate this task, this task, this task. When you talk about CICD, we talk about incorporating like source and version control, not just automation. So you know exactly for that task that's being automated, what is the you know source that's being used to actually perform those tasks. Also, what is the artifact that's produced? That artifact should be version two and tracked. Um, also, the injection of quality gates inside there too, right? So. Like just as you can very easily deploy junky code to production super quickly, um, you can do the same with models um, with you when you don't apply essentially uh, quality gates in between there too to see how that model is performing, um, performing integrated tests on it if it's going to be um, consumed by other consuming applications. So without those CI/CD practices, um, 
yeah, automation can get something faster, but it isn't necessarily going to be, you know, operationally efficient, reliable, or, um, you know, have that end-to-end -end traceability that we typically see customers looking for. Um, I see a question on integrated with Jenkins. Uh, yep, there is a there is a built-in template for Jenkins. There's actually a blog out there as well um, when we added support for that. So I would definitely check out, there's a AWS blog on Jenkins and pipelines. Let's see. There is, yeah, there, um, there's actually a couple different blogs. Each of those blogs have GitHub repositories behind them. Um, let me see if I can actually, I can stop sharing my screen and find a couple of those. The best resource at, at this point in time anyway is AWS blogs is one of them. And then the other one is right here. I'm just gonna send you this. So that one has code. And then there is, if you search on, so with each new feature, as you can imagine, you know, we're, we're iterating on these very quickly too. Um, so a lot of more, a lot more content's coming out. Probably a good starting one too. Um, one thing to check on the, um, I, I see there's a comment on uh, Studio itself. The, yeah, internet connectivity is one thing. The, also the other thing I would check is like in organizations, if you're inside like a VPN um, or you have different firewalls blocking things, because it is using, you know, like web sockets for communication, just want to make sure that there's nothing blocking that communication back and forth. Um, Cause that can lead to some of that um, connectivity issues. And I think we are up on time. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry I went over, I apologize, but hopefully this was useful to everybody. No, actually that's fine. Um, we have some extra times if we have more questions. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions I'm not sure you covered. Uh, uh, I think one of them asking about the uh, host the web apps. Uh, that question. Mm. Yeah, typically we would see it differently. So one of the things that we recommend when building out these pipelines and like what is the end state right for the pipeline is build your model as like a consumable API. So one thing we didn't see inside that pipeline, which is another step that a lot of customers do add on is um, essentially taking that deployed SageMaker endpoint and then integrating it with something like API Gateway. So then your model really becomes more of um, an API, similar to some of our high level AI services where customers access those via API. That way, when you deploy your model as an API, it becomes consumable by, by, to other customers, right? Or other internal customers, whoever the case is, if it's a client application via that API. So instead of, you know, like deploying it along with the web app, it becomes an API that your web app calls. Sorry, I missed that one. The PDF. Oh, and what is the best way for me to get the PDF to you? Do you want me to just send it? I don't know if there's a word to post it. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, you can just send the me, uh, send the uh, PDF to me. Uh, I will share to the attendees. Uh, we usually send the uh, uh, post uh, uh, post uh, events emails uh, with the links to the you know to the YouTube's uh, recordings link and also the the slides link. So uh, you will get the messages. Definitely. Yeah. And if I didn't hit a question or if you think of something, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Happy to, to help out. Uh, we have one more question come up. Oh, um, let's see. <clears throat> Any good guide on learning studio the right way? Um, 
I'd probably point again to that SageMaker examples. Um, if I, let me, there's a section on studio and there are some good um, deep dives as well. I don't know if it's possible if I can maybe consolidate a list of resources because it sounds like studio and then projects and pipelines would be a good one. Is it possible to post that in addition to some of the, like the PDF too? Yes, yes. You can okay. like put whatever the you know consolidated all of the information is sent to me, and then I can share to the to uh, all of them. Definitely, and and our evangelists do a a workshop, a really good workshop um, with Studio that kind of goes through all the different features and that sort of thing. So I'll try to see when that is scheduled for and include that back as well. They, they okay. use some pretty good stuff there. Yes, sounds good. Uh, let's get to the last one. It's the, about uh, integrate with Airflow. Okay, so if you're using Airflow for model build, I assume kind of activities. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so SageMaker, <laughs> thank you. So SageMaker natively integrates with Airflow, as you know, right, to calling out to like training, processing, and that sort of thing. Um, if there isn't a yeah, native integration today with SageMaker pipelines and Airflow directly. Um, so in that case, you'd be looking more at like building out custom, right? Or maybe you just stick with Airflow for your model build activities, and then you can still use projects or pipelines for deployment if you wanted to as well, right? So still using Airflow for that model build, register to a model registry, and then use the deployment only path in SageMaker for SageMaker projects, I should say. 